we're gonna get this ready man i'll tune in i'm gonna start with some music and then i'll get the show on the road Okay, that was The Grind by The Happiest Place on Earth, a Chuck Collison compilation, uh, which was on the album Body of a Crow, which technically still has not seen a, a proper release all these years later. There was a release on the Malay's music label in 2010, but the quality of the audio did not meet the standards of the actual authentic recording. And... Today, I am very, very happy to have on this stream, though I kind of botched it by doing an earlier stream earlier because there's no one here. Today, I'm happy to have on this stream Mr. Chuck Collison himself, and I will be ready to speak to him here momentarily. I'm just going to give him a call. Hey. Hello. How are you? How are you I'm okay. I'm yeah, it's, it's kind of cold around here, but not compared to where you're at, probably. Um, It's like 32 degrees out here, and it's sunny. <laughs> oh. Well, yeah. That sounds like a heat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, spring is definitely here, and the robins are back, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. So, how are you? Um, Go ahead. Uh, I just. Um, I'm really happy we're doing this. This is great because, um, you know, we want to clean up the, the confusion and, you know, 
point to where we're going here. Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, I suppose I'll get started. You have a background in education. What kind of degrees do you have? Well, I had a BS in edu- in education and um, a master or a, a I majored in uh, biology and chemistry. Okay. So uh, I went and taught school for almost twelve years um, in in South Central LA <laughs> and learned how to speak homeboy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, it was kind of fun and it was kind of crazy. But um, that's when I did all, most of my work uh, with, you know, Roz and uh, PE. So um, um, I got nice vacations, you know, summer vacations and others. And so I had a lot of time then to work on this stuff. <clears throat> and um, then I quit and w- moved out into the woods. Basically. I thought, well, you know, I spent my time in... <laughs> the prison of LA and all that crime and everything. So then I went out into the, the woods and I, I did a lot of work there too. Um, and had more time cause I took a break and, um, built a little studio in a cottage way out in the West Marin. And, um, that's, yeah, that's where I really got focused on this stuff. So, um, okay. But, uh, yeah. Did, did you meet Roz in San Francisco? I know um, I met him in L.A. in the Valley at um, a friend of mine's house, and um, we did a a party, basically, together. Um, and Roz invited some of his friends. Gene invited his. Uh, Chris Fuller was a part of it. And yeah. um, that's where we all kind of integrated for a moment, and he got to see what I could do. And... Um, I, I basically put an installation in Gene's house, and <clears throat> um, I just saw that as a really great way to get this thing started. Um, and we started with the happiest uh, place on earth, is what we called it. Yeah, I, I know you've told me this before, but not on the interview. But Chris Fuller had a had a role in naming the label. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, she she had a lot of good ideas, and. Um, I don't know where who came up with the names exactly, but um, of course Roz came up with premature ejaculation. Yeah, but that's not what we were doing at first because Chris wasn't really interested in the name and what they had done in the past. It was a little dark for her. Okay. So, and she, I don't know if she was even around in Roz's life at that point when they when Ron and uh, Roz were doing that first version yeah i don't know either but, i know um, i know she came with them on tour when he was working with valor because she visited him in london yes and that's exactly when i met the two of well i knew chris a little earlier than i knew Roz, but um they had just come back from europe um when we did this party and it was called the weird horse sacrifice and um i actually played with three other people in a outside that of that party on in their backyard um, that was the first time I think I ever played in a band and um, it was kind of fun the neighbors shut it down pretty quick oh the cops showed up <laughs> so, well I think it was, I'm not even sure maybe they did but no no yeah. so that must have been because I'm looking at um, the performance timeline on Rosnet as I talk to you. That must have been more October 5th, 1985, Echo Park, California, private party. Now, that was a little later. Oh, okay. Uh, at my house, um, where I was living, and that's when I re- met Ron A.D. That was the first time I had met him. Really? Yeah. So, so you met Ron A.D. through Roz? Yeah. As a member of PE. That's awesome. Uh, wow. I didn't even think there would be a connection. Yeah. I mean, we didn't do anything at that point. You know, Ron was on to doing his performance art and getting pretty clear about it. he wanted what he wanted to present. And he kind of had it, his time with Roz. Um, 
you know, he, he wrote an obituary of sorts. Yeah, there, there's one for sale on eBay right now. Yeah, it's kind of cool, and it, it says pretty much kind of the same thing I was saying in the book. Yeah. About when his passing, and he was much more eloquent and said a lot more things about it, but it was kind of cool to see his perception of what happened with Roz, and I saw it too, and, you know, I kind of backed out of Roz's life at some point, you know. Yeah. It was, it, it, you know. I understand. I premature ejaculate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, what kind of equipment did you like to use when playing and recording? And are there any instruments or synthesizers from back then that you still have? Um, no, I, well, no, I don't, actually. All of that's changed quite a bit. Um, but my favorite thing that I found um, was the sampling, you know, and um, that came, that was coming in right about that time. And um, my favorite um memory of how that all showed up is that the residents and how they were sampling and um coming up and you know they said they weren't musicians and um but they were visionaries and they were just so um you know so inspirational at that time for me um amongst others you know oh i've got a good story for you about really where i first met Roz. okay but i didn't really meet him we went to see, or I went to see a SPK show. It was the first time they were coming through the U.S. And um, I went there, having read in the L.A. Weekly, you know, that they were doing these interesting things with sound. And, you know, so I go there and I'm starting to, you know, understand what they're up to. And it's kind of, oh boy, was that dark and kind of interesting to me, but... Um, Anyway, somebody was in front of me, and they kept turning this way and that, and they had a big blue mohawk. And I just got, oh, my God, this guy's right in my way. What the hell? (laughs) And and eventually I got sick from just watching this performance. And I went out on the curb, and I I thought I was going to (laughs) vomit. But then I left, but I always remembered that guy in front of me with the big blue mohawk. And then... I don't know when it happened, but years later we went, well, I went to the SPK show. I did too. He said, well, you might have noticed me. I had a big blue mohawk. <laughs> I said, oh my God, you are the guy who got my way over and over. <laughs> and But it was like, that's when I really ber- first saw Roz and, and just didn't understand who it was. And I think Ron was there too, probably. See, but you've got a good story about meeting him back then compared to others because there's accounts of people when they first met him, they didn't even think he was a man. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> uh, Rick? Well, he did come off as, you know... He Valor? Did, he, <laughs> oh boy, he did, Yeah. Yeah, I can understand that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I mean, um, that yeah. So you have a unique experience. Yeah, I think it's pretty unique. Mm-hmm. And I, I just love that we that then later, you know, came together and uh, you know started this thing. And I didn't know it was going into premature ejaculation. Right. I wasn't really aware of all that when I first started. You know, with Roz, I just he wanted to do some poetry readings. And I did a backup thing for him on that uh, at the Lhasa Club, I believe that was. Really? Or club. Yeah, and that was that was probably the next thing we did. What and about uh, What about the Cloister Press? That apparently that, those were the oh, first PE that, shows together that you guys no, no, did. It wasn't a PE show. We never called it PE show. We called it the happiest place on earth, and it was an installation. And it was just another part of doing um, the thing I did in the house at Gene's house. And but this time I wanted to make it more, you know, like that was a lot of different people's music and different rooms. And I don't know, there was a garbage disposal in a (laughs) sound room full of hay. (laughs) I mean, it was just kind of crazy, but it was a little bit like a circus. And um but then we did it at the Cloister Press, and it became even because they both kind of got it that what I was capable of, and I saw what they were capable of, and so we just integrated in this more effective way, and we did several things like that. Um, 
before we even approach the idea of doing the premature ejaculation. Yeah, these concerts right? were not even billed as PE. Yeah, no, they weren't, because we weren't thinking we were PE. But as soon as that name came in, Chris went out. Ah. Oh. Yeah, she didn't like the name, or the, the images that were presented in the past. I guess she had problems with that. But anyway, she she disappeared for the um, first performance, which was, um, you could probably tell. The El, yeah, the one at the El Hasa Club that you were just talking about. Yeah. No, um, no, it was after that. I mean, after the first PE performance was a little later than all that. And then uh, Roz moved back to San Francisco, and then he came down with Lee Wilds and stayed at my house be- to prepare for this thing. Um, he was in medical a, school at that time, correct? Um, oh, Lee? Yes. Uh, not to my knowledge. Oh, um, your, your friend Gene had told me that he was a medical school student that helped uh, Los Angeles start the Clean Needles Project. Oh, okay. Yeah, he did. He, he did a lot of stuff like that, but he wasn't really a medical school, school mm-hmm. student as far as, I mean, he wasn't. He had really nice, great ideas. I mean, he did a lot of things like that. And uh, he, oh, he did help in one of the um, uh, installations we did in a um, loft in uh, in the art district in L.A. He, I think he was and, at the show uh, at the Crypt as well. Yeah, that one was called Views from the Bottling Room. And then the other one at the Cloister Press was called... Um, remind me <laughs> okay the clo- yeah i asked you about uh lee's role because the cloister press yeah, was oh, that's no, before no. that's before that i'm talking like now i'm the crypt when you guys when death oh, cultures crypt. first came out that crypt was the first pe performance after you know it closed with Roz and uh, ron so that was the first one where we where it was called pe yeah and premature ejaculation and so um then it started that from that point on then it was always called premature ejaculation mm-hmm. and it became more of a, a stage performance you know with the crypt show being the first one and it got good reviews and you know it was very um oh yeah it's a good thing you yeah, you even was, got broadcast on college radio in the in the local area there were people playing oh, death right? yeah there were people playing right? death cultures over the air in fact um on Discogs, which is an online, you know, used record outlet for yeah, people. Yeah, I, I, okay, mm-hmm. one of the copies of Death Cultures was bought from the, uh, someone who used to work for college radio or was an owner of a college radio station. And I remember reading that. Okay. So, yeah. Well, that, that cassette didn't show up until probably a year or so later after that first Crip show because it was... We, we put that together kind of during that time he was there in LA and um, you know the backing tape is what I would call that and then it had to you know be polished up and I I got it on um, a reel to reel format and uh, yeah and so I had an 8 track reel to reel that I you know part of my home built studio and so when he came down we built the, the basic backing tracks to that show at the crypt yeah and then uh then he left and i just put i put it all together after that and then it became the cassette and that's that cassette was the first thing that was in the pe catalog basically that started the whole happiest place on earth catalog Mm -hmm. you even registered it you even registered the copyright on it yeah yeah I wanted to see, well, Gene, I lived with Gene at the time, and he was pretty clear about these kinds of things, and he said, yeah, you need to, you know, get your trademark on that, so, yeah, um, and then it just started, um, actually, Boss came back to San Francisco and lived right above me with Eva. Really? Yeah, at Gene's house, and hmm. so then, it, I was on the bottom, in the bottom unit, and they were in the middle, and Gene was on the top. Gene and Stephen were upstairs. And so, you know, you would think that now that we're living together, this would be a time when we'd be producing more stuff, but it didn't quite work out that way. Um, 
because Eva and Roz were now starting to do Shadow Project. Yeah. Were you involved with Is Truth a Crime? Aside from distribution? Uh, with the sh- Shadow Project? The, the Yeah, the video. Yeah. yeah. Um, a little bit. I didn't, they found a whole bunch of, um, Eva and Roz found a bunch of uh, eight millimeter film and they just spliced it together and scribbled on it and did all kinds of things. And then, yeah, once it was on a video, I put it in the catalog. Nice. But I didn't really do anything in the production of that. Do you remember it selling um, very well at all? No, not, nothing really sold that well. You know, it was kind of a weird little catalog, which very few people knew about, you know. And I, and I guess Roz spread the word to the degree that some Europeans got in on this, like John Collins and Scotty. Yep, um, yep. forgot Scotty's name, and Danny. Alex. And yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and all of that started to show up, and it was funny how little interest there was. But, you know, we didn't have... The internet back then. No. <laughs> yeah. No, it was ordered so, through the mail or by phone. Yeah. And Carl, um, he came in on it. He was one of my biggest supporters and fans. He was the first one who actually called me on a telephone and said, oh, this is Carl. I've been ordering your stuff. And um, I was just like, wow, <laughs> I've got a fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he lived in uh, Milwaukee at the time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, um, and then I went and visited him. Oh, really? He took me on the fun tour. <laughs> we went to Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment and before it was torn down, and he pointed up there and he said, "That's where we, we could go up there and have lunch." <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so then we went to the house on the rock, and that was so cool. I've yet to <laughs> go there. Still, it's a staple. No, you gotta go there. It is so much fun. Yeah, it's and a landmark. You know, to me, like, uh, I mean, I grew up in the in the city with the Tallman house where Lincoln stayed when he visited this neck of the states. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's about as historic as my city gets. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he wasn't even supposed to go there. He was supposed to go to Beloit, south of us, but. Uh, okay. people that were part of the big wigs in my city went down there and was like, hey, you should come up here because they were jealous. But anyway, uh-huh. that's, you know, <laughs> neither here nor there, man. <laughs> How long had... So do you... We're gonna, I'm going to segue into something familiar here. You had been recording music before you met Roz. Oh, yeah. And um, that's where we get into I, my favorite of your work that hasn't been properly released in a good way and an album Uh that often gets miscredited to Roz. So tell me about, and tell everybody out there about Body of a Crow. Okay, so that was um, kind of a compilation of things I did. And some of it was um, used in the installations. And, um, but a lot of it was earlier stuff I did, but I wanted to show Roz that I was, you know, all my different, um, interest in different types of music and you know from you know just all kinds of things that i'd come up with because i liked some of my very first things were kind of you know i would never play them for anybody but they were very poppy and you know but then i loved doing things like oh i you know i put on i don't think i put on this one piece that's called my anxiety you know and it was just like the most crazy piece but we played it on a, a radio interview that we did in somewhere out near Pomona. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, that so, was kind of fun. Something that like that exists. Time. Yeah, it was like this. I mean, I never had done a radio interview, and I, Roz was the big voice in that radio interview. And But we gave him a sample of The Happiest Place on Earth. And at that time, we weren't calling it premature ejaculation, so that was pretty early. Mm-hmm. And um, I just kind of sat by and watched as Roz shook his bracelets <laughs> i yeah. remember that he used to have lots of bracelets and and people would call in and you know he he, he was I, he was pretty high on that day I yeah think. i heard he liked to dabble in drugs quite a bit oh yeah yeah and it was funny because he never really pushed his drugs on me and i was 
sober as fuck. <laughs> yeah. Most of the through all all that stuff in that time, I was very sober, and um, he recognized that and said, you know, he never wanted me to join the party. On when that came to that, he just kind of disappeared. Yep. Go do he his did. thing. Yeah, and and they knew that you know I didn't want to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. So, well, yeah, you uh, you have a job at risk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of why I wanted to hide in the back the whole time because, you know, I go to the. I didn't even perform actually in the first performance. I was just running around in the background pulling levers and, you know, making sure everything went well. And um, he went out there and just got crazy. Yeah. And, and Lee Watts was throwing chicken skins on people. And <laughs> that was pretty funny. Wow. Um, yeah. That's crazy. But uh, what was your... Did I answer the last question? Yeah, the about Body of a Crow, because you... <laughs> oh, I didn't finish that. And yeah. So, um, yeah, so I gave that cassette to Roz, and, you know, he said he loved it, and I was very, you know, happy. It, it validated me a lot. Yeah. And Because uh, I'd never really shared any of this with anybody, you know, and so Roz shows up, and I think, well... He was so non-judgmental about other people's art and, you know, trying to, you know, and I'm very judgmental at this time. You know, I'm not, you know, thinking I'm good. I'm not thinking that this is something that he would even want to hear, but he heard it and said, Chuck, I love it. Wow. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. And then when I, gosh, when I got my malaise copy of it, I was just like, kind of, what the fuck? <laughs> this is not, you know, but... Some of those pieces later on made their way onto PE um, pieces because I got to create everything mm -hmm. after that. I noticed you uh, sourced quite a lot from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah, which was part of one of the installations from the bo in the bottling room. Mm -hmm. And that, the whole idea on, in, that, in the bottling room was like, you know, we live in this giant maze of, you know, not knowing which way to go. Sure. We've got doctors on this side and psycho patients on this side and you know it, it was kind of fun and we had some people in that installation running around with straight jackets on and i think lee wilds was he that was his favorite thing <laughs> he got <laughs> wow. to wear straight jacket and sit in the tub in the bathroom <laughs> he was in the bottling room people didn't yeah. know he was in there and then all of a sudden he'd pop out and go oh hi I, i'm crazy <laughs> well here's an interesting yeah, he question was yeah, bloodied I, walls of time ever performed live no oh it should have been that is your best really? oh, spookiest you. track <laughs> you've ever done totally that was totally me yeah yeah and um that was well before Roz showed up um and yeah it is kind of, i i love the lyrics now <laughs> yeah it's kind of funny i listen to these things and i go wow, did I really sing that? And did I really say that? <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. It's like a bigger, like it's pieces of a puzzle that seem to be falling in place today. Mm -hmm. That just, you know, I didn't know this whole time how really I, I, I'm pretty brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I get why now, and it's so exciting to understand why. You know why this all happens and why this all occurred, and that's the bigger story of why I want to come back on the stage for the first time. I want to be on the front. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And I'll be pulling the levers and everything, but I'm going to be in the front, and that's very different for me. But you know, I got help in all kinds of different ways, including your help and so many others that will make you help me too. Yeah. Well, we help each other. You know, that's the. Uh, you were like the light at the end of my tunnel, I swear to God, man. It's... Oh, my God. That's no, crazy. I went through some hell, man. I thought I was yeah. done, you know, and you showed me, no, like, dude, your dream is still there. <laughs> so... Yeah, well, my dream popped right back out when I got out of my tunnel, and yeah. I went down a tunnel almost 10 years, and, you know, almost, well, I was, yeah, I was trying to kill myself. You know, I was trying to premature ejaculate, and, and uh, you know, I had a counselor who just, oh, my God, I couldn't do it without her. And she helped me right out of that. And I knew all the time I was going down my tunnel, I kept saying to myself, well, you can come out at any time. You know, this is, this is what my spirit would tell me. Yeah, you, you can come out at any time. 
but my mind was just like being thrown around and uh i need to calm it down yeah so as soon as you know first thing i knew i had to start meditating again because i i'm a big meditator and so and i feel like that is the way in to your higher intelligence sure you know? so yeah so i've been on that path really much of my life because i survived hiv yeah and AIDS. i mean people People may not know that, and they you they know, don't. Yeah, well, that was me walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, and that's what that song "Truth to Be Told." I don't even know what the name of the it's song. Soul, uh, it's soul and spirit. Soul, soul, and, soul and spirit. spirit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was feeling like my soul and spirit. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> and I had to sit down and meditate to find it. Another good uh, track on that album is "The Circus." Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was kind of my first attempt at being happiest place on earth. Or, I mean, sorry. Um, Chuckles. Uh, well, yeah, but um, uh, everlasting happy life. Mm-hmm. And so that I gave t- that project that song. And then it started to happen where I could use my voice thinking of a concept of this thing called the everlasting happy life which i got that from a church a chinese church in la i saw this up on the you know their marquee if you will and then i thought oh that's a great name (laughs) and it matched what i'm doing with the happiest place on earth so yeah everlasting happy life right so it's so it's like yin and yang everlasting happy life and blinding black light of hate yeah yeah there you go yeah (laughs) right (laughs) You know, and it's funny how you see that from your perspective, and now I, uh, you know, and because I can't tell you why this is so funny, but it just is. <laughs> anyway, onward. Yeah. <laughs> <Christian> so- <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, so I, I live for source most of, the, most of my time, you know, and, and little things will throw me off, but, you know. Oh, it's just coming through in such an amazing way, and that's why I need to go back on the stage and tell the story. Okay. Um. And yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I'm. I'm. There's so much stuff I could ask you right now. I'm. I'm trying yeah, not to jump I'm around all. All the time because I. I'll just go off into something that your listeners won't really. I don't know. Maybe they won't get it. <laughs> uh, if they'll try to, you mean you the the yeah. live the live. The, the radio interview you just mentioned, none of us knew that existed. So when people oh, hear okay. this, they're going to go looking for that now. You know, so... Oh. <laughs> well, I did have a recording of it, and I think I it got all... You know, it was on cassette tape, and it was just... Ah, you know, it got pulled out or something. And it got eaten? I don't think... Yeah, something like that. And so I don't think it's ever going to... Unless somebody else recorded it. Somewhere. Or the station kept a copy. Yeah, that's possible. Mm-hmm. I, I would be able to tell you what the station was. But, sure. Uh, it, so it was out there here where he lived in Pomona. So and and, I think he was with his at his parents' house at that time. Oh, Roz. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So when I first met him, he was living with his mother and father. Yeah. In, in Pomona, and I used to go out there and pick him up, you know, and. Um, Oh my God, his mother was really interesting. Yeah, I've heard she's a really nice person. Oh yeah, she was sweet as can be. She really liked me because I looked normal. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else came with piercings and tattoos, and and she thought, oh my God. And you should have seen his room. She'd sit in the living room, rocking in her chair, <laughs> watching Jerry Farwell, <laughs> and then Roz was in his room with a coffin in there <laughs> and dead cats on the wall. <laughs> oh man. It was crazy. Yeah. Uh, wow. I got one. I, do you want to hear this story? Hey. This is a pretty good one. So, um, so, Roz comes home from being in L.A. one day, and he walks in the front door, and his mother's sitting there in the chair, you know, holding something, and um, he goes, uh, what's up? And she says, she picks up only theater of pain, which she had, she says, I found this in your room. And this is you, isn't it? And she points to the album. And she said, the, 
whatever, Jerry, Far- somebody, some preacher she was listening to on the TV had shown the album on the, the, um, the show. Yeah. And she couldn't, she said, oh my God, I think I've seen that. She went into his room and found it. And oh my God, she said, I can't believe my son is the, working with the devil. <laughs> and oh boy, Ross just went, oh shit. <laughs> wow. Oh, I can find her out. So yeah, she she kind of found this all out about him, and you know it was later it was kind of funny, but at the time you know it was kind of a tragedy. <laughs> yeah, well, in Roz had told this story in the Golgotha interview, but he did not go into that kind of detail at all. Oh really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And Never. so you were there when this happened. Well, I wasn't there, but he had told me, you know, what happened just shortly after. So, yeah, you've got more detail than what he gave uh, John Ellenberger. Really? Yeah, he didn't go into uh, that. He got he got scolded that like that. Wow. In her, his house was really interesting because, yeah, mom was sitting right in the living room and his bedroom was right off the living room. And so it was such a contrast. You know, she's sitting in there listening to the, the evangelists and is in the other room writing poetry about yeah it's polar opposites right. yeah um, no, this might be a good time to put in something that i found later to be very interesting that Roz had a visitation you know he saw um a ufo oh really did you know um I didn't know anything so i gotta pull out a cassette now and read something Dead Babies cassette, Shadow Project, Triple X Records, 1991, I want to say. And Roz said, at age seven, my best friend and I experienced a UFO sighting. That same year, I had my first encounter with the music and theater of Alice Cooper. I truly believed at that time that this man could very well have been a pilot of the above-mentioned spacecraft. Both experiences remain deeply inspirational to me. This recording is a tribute to one of the first and most innovative pioneers of musical theater. I've seen several several UFOs since that night, but very few performers who could match the spirit of Alice Cooper. Roz Williams, oh, August of 1992. You know, I loved Alice Cooper. He was, he was somebody who showed this kind of theater of rock and roll. Yeah. And he was such a... a amazing experience when i saw him on in concert yeah you know um on tv and i just thought oh my god what's possible with rock and roll is you know this guy's amazing so i get that what he said and you know what i know about that because i've just been listening to very interesting for me about other realities and stuff that you know we're we're waking up to something amazing on planet Earth right now. Oh yeah, and and the the information coming through, and what I've been told by some of these people who have the information is that I was part of the first wave, and I speak with people today that are also part of this wave, um, and so they make sense of it to me, and um, I didn't know until just recently how important this was. And so, um, Roz may have been a part of that. He's part of the cluster that came forth to help the world understand something much bigger than he could do from his drug perspective. But anyway, Alice Cooper, oh, I'm so glad you read that thing because that now makes a lot of sense. So what the aliens do (laughs) is they can't directly talk to us sometimes, but they get our attention. Yeah, and they did the download, and so Roz received a download in those experiences from the other dimension, and it's the, it's so interesting. He saw Alice Cooper being in the spacecraft because, you know, when I got my Alice Cooper, it was also Jethro Tull. Yeah, you know, and and that guy just there's a lot a big long story I could tell about that, but. I got the same thing about the same time because that would match our ages, you know. Well, he's got 
not quite, but you know, oh, that's so, yeah, pretty close. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love seeing that. So that's big. Roz, Roz believed in extraterrestrials. Yeah, and I kind of poo pooed it all until recently, until wow. I came out of my tunnel and started on this path of understanding who we are at our core you know who we are we're our spirit we're energy and so from that understanding a lot of things start to show up and so oh wow i didn't know this interview was gonna have this effect on my understanding of what's going on here but it's it's pretty interesting yeah well i'm glad you're recording it because i'm gonna have to listen to it again. yeah we're, we're, <laughs> we're streaming over youtube right now um tiffany oh, essex oh. says we're that i'm doing a great interview so thank oh, you, good. thank you, <laughs> Tiffany. Thank you for participating. You know, and, and everybody else, thanks for coming in and, and listening to the big cheese, <laughs> the main man. <laughs> so you've got a show coming up in Vegas and somewhere uh -huh. else. So this yeah, can be Montreal, your opportunity. Vegas. Yeah, go Montreal, ahead. Vegas and a DNA Lounge in San Francisco. So, and um, I forgot the order of it. But um, it's all going to happen within a week. So I'm getting organized around that and, um, you know, trying to make it streamlined because it's with Eva. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. You know, get back on the stage where Eva is. And she's been such a good friend in the past. And she understands a lot of this stuff, too. Mm -hmm. you know, we had a pair of parallel paths for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah was I it? Don't know how parallel they are now, but. Yeah, we're gonna find out. She's she's kind of a really recluse, you know. She's she's sort of like over the idolatry, and you know, the, he doesn't want to be. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> I get it. So, did you contacted her? Uh, I tried. I mean, she did not back, but she's she's very like I said. She's Brian, uh, Pitcher, um, he's the organizer of some of it, and he. Um, he, he came on and said, don't take this personally. Mm -hmm. He's like this. That's, and she, he talks to her regularly, but if I need to know about her, I just can contact him. He's yeah. pretty helpful. Okay. Like, talk, and he's going to be helpful too. So he got the show he together. Got the sixth for that part of Your, your connections, your signals going in and out, Mr. Cullison. Okay. Well, let me try See, I move the phone. Are we doing good? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that was quite a surprise when that was announced. Uh, many people know about the Vegas show. They don't know about many of the others. And I was like, wow, maybe... Th did, yeah. I was thinking, like, did the two of them just have a phone call or something? Like, Because you were just talking about wanting to do stuff with her. And then you were also talking about wanting to do stuff with other people Roz knew. And it's like... That happened quick. Oh, no, it's starting to fall into place real quickly. Yeah. And it's yeah. And so that's why I got to be really focused on this thing so that I can, you know, start the message. And, yeah. Um, and that's that's the best. My first, you know, just one step at a time, one step at a time, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, the 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 one that's going to come later is going to be uh, what I'm seeing is a full blown performance where I headline. And um, I have a really good helper, Steve Estrada, Esteban Estrada, who DJs down in Juarez, Mexico. Okay. And he's, he's been a DJ for a while, and he goes by the name Roz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's some other guys down there, a guy named Angel, and he's going to help. And we're going to put together a, a show in Juarez, which ought to be a lot of fun. Nice. Because you can do whatever you want down there. Right, and right. They don't really care. And, so, and they just want, cra you know, they're they're into crazy. <laughs> yeah, of course. So, so what... And, um, and Rod, in one of his interviews, said he loved Mexico City, he loved playing there. It's sort of like, you know... I oh, yeah. There. It's, it's, and that could be another place to go, you know. But I, I see it as a roaming circus now, and um, that's the bigger picture. And a lot of people will get involved. And I've got cousins in Michigan that play beautifully. And um, and I'm starting to contact them. And I've got, you know, people around where Carl is and you are. That's going to be a great 
you know, oh, yeah. place to come. I've got and I've got Not a couple of area, friends. I've got relatives all around that area, so you know. I've got a couple yeah. of friends in my local area who are just very eager to meet you as much as I am. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's 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 some people I know in Beloit who are Roz fans too, and they've been aware of my fandom of you since I was very young. So, <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah. I also, I, you, we can use this platform to give you an opportunity as well. Um, you're using the name Premature Ejaculation, which is understandable. Yeah. You were a part of that project. But Roz isn't here anymore. So why? Yeah. what was your decision? Well, what helped you come to that conclusion, well, like, I'm going to do this? Well, okay, here's the truth. 90% of the music that came after Roz and Ron did it, I put that stuff together. I I put the albums together. I, I did it all, you know. And so if Roz is crying from where he is now and saying, Chuck, you own that now. Please own it. Yeah, <laughs> no it kidding. Yeah. And so much of it, I have to tell you, like, uh, you know, at least 90% of what was put together. And I did it all. Yeah. You know? And we stayed away from record companies as much as possible. And I had a studio in my house, and I was just playing with it. And I would send what, you know, Roz needed money. <laughs> and so he would call me up and say, can we put together something else? And then we'd get a couple thousand dollars out of it. But, you know. Hmm. And the thing is, I haven't gotten any money from any of it. Yeah, and I'm curious, because um, in 1993, Cleopatra Records put out a premature ejaculation album called Necessary Discomforts. The very first song on Necessary Discomforts is called Non-Union. Yeah. Non-Union is Pulse, a Happiest Place on Earth recording. Oh, is it? Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. I was throwing things in all over the place. I was hoping Um, you'd have some information on that, because Pulse was the VHS and cassette that you had to play together. Well, I did that. Yeah. I I made that. VHS uh, still hasn't surfaced, but the audio has. the audio for and Pulse I, is the exact same as Non-Union. Oh, it's just, it's just cut in half. Because it's been so long. Yeah. Well, I did. I put together that whole Non-Union. Was, I just sampled Roz's performance from that Crip show, the first Crip show. And I used his voice in there. And then I found some rebar around and made the, the, the sound of the bells. And I sampled that. And, My you know, goodness. And, and I used just like him screaming and doing stuff from that show but i yeah that was like i mean without his samples well then his voice wouldn't appear in there and, but so I, that is Roz's yeah. voice that's cool and that's from a live yeah, show yeah. interesting yeah and it, it just and i made it 13 minutes and 34 seconds long as and Roz suggested that mm-hmm. you know? at the time we we had to talk on the telephone you know to get clear about what things were going to happen and so and sometimes he sent me you know a cassette or a letter or something to to just a lot of times it was just thanks chuck i love you and you know we're over here in europe and i i found a letter the other day that was we just loved each other yeah you know, no matter what and and he got darker and i got lighter and we couldn't see each other anymore so you know Geographically, we didn't see each other, but I just kept you know, taking his suggestions on things, you know, then going into the laboratory, <laughs> right? Cooking up, with, you know, things, and it's, but you know, just to he was inspirational, very much so, and we had the same. Yeah, we were probably in that first wave that I listen to the woman who talks about the first wave and um, how important it is mm-hmm. to understand this now that I see that you know I was a teacher and, <laughs> and a going musician out. yeah are, are we okay yeah is now, now we are yeah it's I'll just I'll, I'll okay. tell you when I when the signal if I'm hearing any breaks and it happens more than once okay. I, I say something but as you yeah. were. 
So he was very uh, no. inspirational to you. I've read that he yeah. was actually a very hard person to be around for very long periods of time. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, even he didn't stay married for too long. Yeah. And, um, Were uh, you at the wedding? Uh, yeah, I was. What was it like? Oh, it was fun. Yeah? They went to the place where Harold and Maude got married. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So they, it was on at Land's End in San Francisco. And I didn't live up there at the time, but he did. And he invited me, so I went. And, um, yeah, they went right to the, where the hole, I think there's a hole somewhere where, um, you know, I don't know if you know the movie, but um, Harold was always killing himself, <laughs> so he, you know, or faking it. And so he jumps into this hole, and it was that's where they did the ceremony. So they actually had a, someone there to officiate it, like, I don't know, a priest or a rabbi or whatever? Yeah, somebody. I don't remember who was there, but um, it was very unconventional. But yeah. Well, we so were the following concerts, them. man. Their wedding reception was two live concerts under the name Christ Death, and the first one was Germs Covers, and the second one, he oh, got, yeah, he got so covers. plastered. Yeah. He got so plastered the second show, he couldn't even get one song into his set. They had to carry him off stage, so I've read. Oh, is that right? That's oh, what I've read. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. But, so yeah, I have the Germs uh, show at the Variety Arts Center, man. That's, I can't wait for uh -huh. a, a lower generation copy of that to surface. I, I have the Germs sure. covers from that night on our channel, but we don't have the complete concert. They opened up with a Christian Death song. No, that's cool that you were yeah, at that I, I show. I was very aware of what was going on at that time. I don't even know where that was. It's at the Variety know. Arts Center. In Which Los is in L.A.? Yes, or? yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a while ago. <laughs> and, and, and the show he got really messed up at was uh, Zombie Zoo. Oh, okay. Yeah, With under uh, the name Christ Death. Yeah, I remember him using the Christ Death name, and... Uh, yeah, yeah, now it's could be I, I'm starting to remember. Yeah. But I remember seeing a picture of him in the LA week and he was just like he was crashed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they they weren't giving him the greatest review, but no. Oh. That yeah, crazy, yeah. man. And and then he didn't put on another show after that until the show he got messed up. He didn't do another show until he worked with you in in uh Dodge International in Tucson, Arizona. The end is oh, yeah. here. And that was a true premature ejaculation. But we still didn't use the name premature ejaculation. For the end is here? April 8th, 1989? Oh, uh, God. You know, maybe we did. Yeah, that was kind of like a combination plate. Yeah, that was because um, Chris had gone. Yeah, you're right. And so that was premature ejaculation. But... It was kind of the installation as well. Mm -hmm. So we did the maze. It was used from the bottling room, maze, the rat videos going through the maze and the doctors talking. And um, at the end, you, you go through the maze in this art space, and at the end of it was the stage, and that was the end. The end is here. You know, like in a maze, you have the oh. thing. Yeah, so that was the idea was calling it the end was here but then of course the end is here you know it's very cryptic yeah people <laughs> so, think of apocalyptic things when they see that yeah but it was also yeah the maze we have to make our way through the maze to find that there is no end here wow <laughs> you know and there's never an end you right know, once you understand you're a spirit and your energy then you know how could there be an end infinity <laughs> so um but all this becomes more con you know makes more sense to me now that i see the bigger picture sure and and these are little puzzle pieces all along the way and now i'm putting that all together and seeing how important this is to bring it up again and tell the bigger story which is what you got to go to see the show for yeah for sure Mm. and then just more is going to come out and i'm going to get more clear about what i need to say so but this yeah. is a great foot first step in you know it's great so you you made 
music with Roz for several years during his career, and there are still yeah. unreleased recordings under the PE moniker that have yet to come out. But among those that have surfaced, like going back at least 15, 16 years now, there's one that has always stood out among fans that I get asked about quite a bit, that uh, there's discussions about quite a bit, and that's the uh, performance you guys did at the Underpass. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I was coming back from, I think I was coming back from San Francisco, and I stopped at uh, in the valley at a, I think it's called Wheatland Road or something, and I get out there to take a piss, and I'm under this underpass, and all of a sudden I notice the sound, it's really amazing. So um, I left there and thought, oh, I should bring back a bunch of stuff, tell Roz about this, because he lived nearby at the time, mm-hmm. but... Uh, and so then he and I went back there and banged up some instruments, recorded it, and thought, okay, well, that's good. And we went back another time, and then we thought, well, let's have people show up and make this a little concert. And so um, Gene and Steven showed up, and uh, I think Chris was there, and mm-hmm. another Chris that I can't remember his last name, but he was the one who, uh, Roz was living with him for a little while not too far from this place. And so we all got there and made a backing tape and, you know, just started banging things around up underneath the, took this big giant white cross and started banging it up yeah. onto the roof of this underpass. And that's kind of the base, that, that sound, when I heard that sound later, I said, oh, that's going to be the beat <laughs> on uh, estimating, the time, estimating the time of death. And I just went in the, my lab and I took all these recordings and I just cut them all up and sampled them and came out with that album. That I do, was, I do know, like the raw recording. Later. I do love the raw recording of Underpass, though. Even just hearing you tap yeah, on your toy know. piano in the background. I just, played, I just started playing that the, the other day. I came up, I found that cassette, and I started playing it. And I thought, oh my god. <laughs> you can hear cars driving by. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And I also hear you tapping on a toy piano in the background too. Doot, 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 oh, yeah. doot, doot, doot. <laughs> <laughs> and I was banging a, a, my tailgate of my little pickup truck, and I was playing this. Some of those pieces that were in there were a couple pieces that were made for something else, and I put those in Kugelnobin, I think is how you say it. I don't yeah, know. yeah, Rod yeah. Came up with a lot of the names. I asked you about so, that because I was like, "What's this doing yeah, on side B of my tape?" <laughs> What's that? I asked you about that because I was like, what's this doing on side B of my underpass tape? And then that's, that's when you told me side A is the show you yeah. did with Roz. And side B is the show that you and Eric Lanzalotta put together in private, if I'm correct. And that ends with Cool yeah, Novin. I, mean, I don't know. You know, it's, I know Eric Lanzalotta was probably there. At, yeah, I think for sure he was there at the last part. But he may have been who I went. I went there three times recording. And yeah. he may have been the one who I took the second time. That may be. And then Roz came on the third time. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, you know, it's weird. Three visits. I remember there were three times. Yep, 86 and 89 and the one only you know about. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the three visits I'm talking about were very, you know, within a month or two. Oh, okay. Yeah, it just came together pretty quick. And then, um, but... Later, I took it into, you know, I just kept using some of that. But I don't know what made we decide and Roz decide that. We just used that cassette. And I would just do the same thing I did with all the installations, which was to just grab this, grab that, grab this, you know, and turn it into a sort of discipline. So the installations were what were the basis of, you know, the happiest place on earth installations for the basis of asserted discipline which was our first album on vinyl that eric lancelotta put out yeah i and have gave that him the money yeah the speed money and then he gave me a bunch of copies of that in return i still have so many of those copies it's crazy you well, know? hey ha- keep them for the merch table some. man <laughs> If anybody wants an assertive discipline LP and wants to buy one, contact Chuck Cullison or go see him when he plays in Vegas and buy it off the merch table. Yeah, there you go. I'll bring him with me on the road. Oh, that's a great idea. Of yeah. Uh, why not, man? <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Well, I used to do that when I went to Hamilton. I I did that. You know, I brought the sets and everything. 
It's great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people to this day beg for reprints from this label. And I don't think they understand. Yeah, like, it's powers are limited in that aspect. Tape duplicators yeah, are expensive. It's funny that cassettes and LPs or vinyl has lasted the test of time. Mm hmm. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. I, I thought when I start pulling out all these things that I had in boxes, that some of these cassettes would just be dust but no not at all they sound just as good as they did yeah yeah Yeah, they didn't deteriorate either which is good because cassette tapes if you're not careful and they're not stored properly the audio can deteriorate over time yeah and especially if you got it next to a magnet or something yeah always back them up to highest quality digital that you can man get an external hard drive if you have to it's also yeah. good for digital remastering yeah, I'm on too. Yeah, path to do all that. And, yeah, uh, Nico V is really going to be an inspiration and a help as well. So he's the next interview, and it's done. It's going to be done with a camera. <laughs> yeah. So this is great to do this first, so that I can get it down. That you know, it's not that hard. No, Just of course not. Ask, answer the questions. <laughs> And I, I would have did a, a, a like a, a video conference call style, but I wanted to conserve my internet so that people could have this stream uninterrupted without problems, and that way, if I use yeah, my no, phone, it's for me. Yeah. yeah, so it works for me for sure. So PE was like an on and off thing. I remember you said uh, yeah, a long Ross time ago. I definitely was, and he he came in with other people and did. And I just said, well, I'm not, I'm not available right now. I've got this going on or whatever. So he went off and did it with other people like um, Paris, Eric, um, Freeman, um, Eric Freeman, Todd Freeman. You know, they kind of integrated quite well. And, you know, he, you know, Eric Freeman and Boz had a very magnetic experience. Yeah, they were very close. Yeah. Very I, close. I, I've, just brought, I've just started contacting uh, Eric again, and he's he's so yeah. We mm-hmm. get each other way back when. So, and he's been through his tunnels, you know, and came out the other side, and he's doing fine. Yeah, he's 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 pretty quiet and uh, has put that part of his life behind him. Nice person yeah. though. Yeah, he's sort of like I was. Yeah. You know, I I sort of thought you know okay that's done. I did that, been there, done that, and now I'm on to different things. And so I did on my path to Roz, after I left teaching, I went to be uh, started studying um, nutrition and and healing arts because I was you know kind of scared. I thought I was going to die, and uh, but I knew that there was an answer. Yeah, and I prayed to God, and God, and God came through, and um, and it was source. It, you know, you can call it whatever you want, but. You know, what has guided me through to yeah and um it's helped yeah, you grow and, strong and people get weird about all that stuff but that's their problem yeah <laughs> let, let, let them deal with it you know yeah uh, right? you guys did two so, shows in 1994 uh in whittier california and san francisco in the month of april uh yeah i did the san francisco one but i Oh, wait, I did the Whittier one. Yes, I did. Yeah, uh, Animalis Records, which is Eric Lanzalotta's label. Yeah, that was a pretty fun show. Yeah. I'm trying to remember what we did there. I, I'm, I'm hoping know. Cecilia's video surfaces someday, but from what I've... Oh, I would love to see that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was a very dark venue, so it's better for the I audio remember that. than the video. There were some problems there, you know, but, but it came out pretty good. I don't know. I wonder if I have the recording of that. That's the same day totally Kurt Cobain was found dead. Show. But I definitely remember the one in Francisco and mm-hmm. some of the problems that occurred there. And you know, my favorite it was a concert, event, you know, a bigger event, and there were more bands involved and stuff, and so it was kind of a big deal. Yeah, and that was uh, the same day Kurt Cobain's body was found. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I remember Eva was the first one who brought me that information. She was almost crying. Really? Yeah, no, it was kind of urban because you know, she knew some of those people, you know. Oh yeah. Or something. Yeah, she knew Jill Emery, who yeah, played bass Jill for was playing with Courtney. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, 
And That's Jill was sad. so much. I like Jill a lot. She was great. To, and she was in Shadow Project when I was in Shadow Project. Yeah. Which was one show. Yep. <laughs> one small part in the recording. Uh, maybe I'll let that video go, huh? <laughs> I don't. I see. Yeah, I've been. I I've been hesitant on posting the video of that show because your friend Steven's the taper, and if I can't oh, get his okay, then I'm not gonna post oh. the whole show. You know what I'm saying? Oh, he would say okay. Right yeah. Now. Okay. I can. I can try to contact him. I've kind of lost contact with you. Yeah. My my copy oh. of the show is incomplete. And I know they have a better copy than I do because they taped yeah, it. But because he, he, he's kind of like me, very organized person, yeah. very smart. He, he, he put a capital thing to the value of things mm-hmm. for the future. And so it surprised me at all. He kept a lot of the photos. My God, he's got yeah. He still has the microphone Roz used. Is that right? That in in PE shows, yeah. Huh. Last I knew. Oh God, he ruined my microphone <laughs> once. He put it inside of a uh, something, a big plastic container that was full of glass, and he's sticking this, my microphone in there. And I just bought it, <laughs> and there was beer in there or something. And ah, uh, jeez, <laughs> that was at the Lectisternium. You guys played there a couple of times. One of those was the show yeah, for yeah. Night Sweats. Uh huh. And then there was another one. I gotta go into Rosnet's little timeline now. This is like my go-to list. <laughs> but yeah, I think okay. you guys have played there a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. We 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 did some good things there. I, I know Eric uh, Lancelotto was a part of that, and um, it was in Culver and City. The, the guy who was running the place was really cool, and I forgot what his name is. But we used him. He's on the happiest uh, second volume. Of the happiest uh, apes on Happy Earth. Music I'll of play. Earth, Volume 2. Yeah, that one had more of the... The first one was kind of like, you know, here and there stuff. And I was just trying to get enough out there to... to I thought a compilation and going in that direction was good. And once I did that and saw that it could work, the second one was more like a lot of different people. Yeah. Yeah, I, and he was a part of that. The guy who was the running the lectosternium, he did some sensitive, was it? I think. I don't know. <laughs> I think I, oh, here it is. Yeah, I can pull my first generation dub out and find out because <laughs> somebody Xerox me. Of those people Roz was friends with, or he met them, and then he'd say, "Oh, send Chuck a you know a copy of this or something like that," and he'll put it on a. He wants to make another compilation. And know and so yeah what a weird track name for sensitive gfgawd live on kxlu that's the guy who does all that whispering that i can't understand if i'm correct yeah no that i thought that whispering was um that was uh consumer's stress institute but oh yeah yeah years of the modern it was either todd gooch or somebody oh there was another guy he was really cool i forgot his name now are you still in touch but with Todd? I, I, it sounds like his voice. And he was more like me with all my, um, you know, synthesizers and electronic understanding and stuff. And, and he was the guy that was kind of had the whole thing recorded and played with it and got it tuned up. Sure. For them and their thing. But they, they came on stage with us and as premature ejaculation um, a couple times um, in, um, in L.A. At, maybe it was the Zombie Zoo. Yeah, you were telling work. me about that. Todd Gooch did uh, did some spoken st- stuff. I've heard the show. It, it, it's uh-huh. so I, did, I didn't know that was him talking. I always thought that was either you or some something being played yeah, on no, a recording in the background. The Consumer Stress Institute was kind of him, Todd Gooch, and uh, Eric Freeman. And they submitted that, and I, I like that piece. And so I, and it was came off of their um, the the big longer cassette that they did. I, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> so it was sampled from a full length. Okay. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And then you put us, you put quite a few on Happy Music too, as well. But I think your best was Death Deceiving. That track oh, is the you. shit. Yeah. That was.
was kind of like, yeah, to me, that was my the best thing I had done to date. Yeah, and, very uh, ahead of its time, by I the way. my voice, and I cut it all up, and, you know, that was fun. That, that was very ahead of its time. I mean, well, thank you. yeah, because they didn't, you me. didn't start hearing music like that in the, in I keep hearing that commonly. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, really, really? Oh yeah, I guess it was. That well, was yeah. the whole intention, Chuck. <laughs> you wouldn't hear anything that would sound remotely similar to Death Deceiving until like the late 90s, early 2000s. And that's if you even bothered to look for it. I mean, that, that's an amazing track. It's still one of my favorite. It is my favorite off of volume two. I mean, which, which, which one? Death I Deceiving. Got, got cut out there a little bit. Death Deceiving, oh, yeah. That is like my favorite off that compilation right well, there. You, you, you know, and if you listen to the lyrics, it's really um, about me trying to grapple with this whole AIDS thing. And I wanted to survive. And so death is deceiving, you know, and it's making me feel like I need, you know, I mean, it's scary. But, you know, and I was feeling you know, up on the ceiling, whirling. <laughs> I can't remember all the lyrics, but... One step forward, two lyrics, steps please. back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, right. I'm taking one step forward, and sometimes I feel like I'm taking two steps back. Today, I would say I take one, one two, three steps forward, and maybe one little step back. Mm-hmm. Because I'm free of that. Right. That whole, because now we have pills or whatever, you know, and it's just a non-issue. You know, yeah, it's, the whole thing that being HIV positive is such a non-issue today. It's like, but back then, oh my God, you know, I had friends dropping dead every week. Mm-hmm. Not imagine. Yeah, it's, AIDS is no joke, man. I'm glad they found a way to at least treat it. Oh yeah, and they're they've got it. They're, they're just sit around the corner where they just get it rid of it. But you know, the powers that be, <laughs> the money, yeah, will disappear, and so. You know, who knows how long they're going to stretch this out. But mm. And when they make another one. <laughs> uh, they, they try to treat COVID like it was HIV. Nobody acted the way they did when HIV first hit. We weren't being locked into our homes and being told to social distance or not have sex or whatever, you know. Right, right. But boy, that scared me at first. I saw the little things on YouTube or whatever. People were saying all kinds of weird things. No, it's, it, I thought there were going to be dead bodies everywhere. <laughs> well, it's not even a decade before that. There was key parties and wife swaps and like it was hip to be a swinger oh, wow. in the 70s and shit. And when the AIDS pandemic kind of that, all that shit was gone out the window. Yeah, like in an instant almost. It was mm-hmm. kind of like. And, and I remember the day when I found out that, you know, I was swimming in the same pools as all these people, and I just went dark. Oh, wow. That's when all this music started to occur, because it was kind of my cathartic, um, you know, you know, music is an amazing connector. It's a healer, for sure. It is. Yeah. And so that's what I was doing, is, you know, trying to get this darkness out of me. And um, now I see how well I did. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job. Yeah. So are, are you retired today? Well, no. <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever retire. You know, I mean, it's more fun to play. I, I mean, like, um, employment-wise, like, is your, your uh, former well, I background. I work as a chef. I'm oh. a chef. And um, I work close to where I live, um, only in the summers. But I bought a house in Costa Rica, Mm -hmm. and that's my, oh my gosh, this is just an amazing part of my life now, and, um, but it's not going to affect anything on time, I just, I know I can have, I I don't watch TV, I don't do, you know, things that a lot of people would do that waste a lot of time, and I just connect, and I'm led today, and so, when you get to that point, it's very few people get to this point. And my counselor says, yeah, Chuck, you're doing just fine, you know? Yeah. And I've had a therapist counselor that's helping me with all of this. So, that's good, man. That's, that's... Yeah. And it'll just come through. It, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how people respond to this. So for a while, 
you, you had mentioned earlier there was a period when you were working with Roz and you two were like committed to stay away from record labels. Oh, yeah. What what changed well, when, when Dark Vinyl got involved? I'm sorry, say that again. What, what changed that when Dark Vinyl was getting involved? You know, Anesthesia. Um, um, well, you know, he was away doing his thing in Europe and, you know, um, meeting those people. And so, um, yeah, we just decided that he needed to make money. And I, I didn't mind making money. At the time, I needed money, too. And so um, we, we just started sending these things to the different record companies. But he, he found the record companies and then connected me with them. And then I sent them the, the masters. And they printed it up and paid us at that time. Um, but then, like I said, that was it. I've never done okay. that. But now I'm, it's time to go back and reclaim it all. Sure. Yeah, I, I heard they. I heard Dark Vinyl, like, there was an issue in the paperwork and they didn't pay him enough at first or something like that. But Yeah, they, you know, they play games. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, another thing we had talked about prior in, in our last, in our private conversation, I had asked you about Living Monstrosities. Uh-huh. And you said Ross got that from a movie? Yeah, it's called Freaks. Freaks. And I just found, yeah, I just found that in my video cassette collection. Nice. And, yeah. Uh, VHS, buddy. Right? I just found it right after we talked about it. Yeah. You know? And, you guys would so, sample but, from movies quite a bit. But I don't have VHS player, so. Oh, they're really they're cheap, good. man. They're cheap. I just to, yeah. make sure your your magnets are cleaned. And yeah. <laughs> well the one i have eight two tapes so i said i'm not putting any more tapes in there <laughs> no mm -mm. definitely not um i capture tapes to digital and then i have a friend yeah. out west who where if you wanted it like to be a super giant size like 8 to 12 gigabyte file with like lossless audio and complete frames like you would like watching the tape he does that he'll do like blu-ray yeah. quality freaking remasters of garbage vhs and even good vhs he'll make look wow. better yeah okay well you know you got friends nico's got friends mm -hmm. uh, nico's gonna do this box set i'm looking forward to it yeah i'm just hoping i, I can mean, afford I it when it comes stuff. out and you know and he needs to i mean to get the best copies i've got to get a, a my reel to reel fixed and that's got like death cultures on it it's got uh a sort of discipline on it, you know, and I've got all those real to reels too. So, and Nico's going to help with that. Hey, and cool. so he knows somebody in LA that has a, a similar kind of setup. And so when I go down there um, to do the, that interview, which is probably going to occur pretty soon, like yeah. between, I told them somewhere between the 4th and the 14th of April when I have some time to go down there. And then we'll figure out that from there because. He needs those to make the box set. For sure. The best it can be. You know, I mean, we want it to be the best. So, you know. So some and of it's that, going to be... Go really ahead. sticks out why it, the body of a crow was such a poor copy. I mean, it's just funny that it, they even let that out. Yeah, I mean, because you were disappointed me, it with like that. so disappointing to hear it. I thought, oh my God, you know, they put that out? <laughs> Yeah, and there's somebody who wants to do a reprint of uh, Death Cultures. Hasn't that already yes. happened? What's so, that? I said, hasn't that already happened? We there was a yeah, fan in I Italy. Mean, but, but this guy wants to do some vinyl, and he wants to do maybe cassettes. I don't know. He's he's we we haven't really spoken much about it, and there's too much going on right now for me to to put another thing in. For sure, possibilities hang, but it's gonna come through. So we're talking about death cultures. I it got me coming to think about uh, death cultures too, and what's the yeah, story which behind is really that? Really similar to death cultures three. Why did you guys I recall just, it? Well, I just thought you know this idea of one, two, three. It's like the the movies, the horror movies. <laughs> well, and so you know, it's just kind of fun. Oh, I I had been I had read that there was only supposed to be two, but you guys were not very happy with two at all. So you like recalled it and re-released it. Well, I 
I did. I mean, it was up all up to me. So because Roz had pretty much disappeared, and I was just thinking of ways to kind of make it mm-hmm. more interesting, or you know, oh, let's pull Death Cultures two, and then everybody will want it. <laughs> but it's really what Death Cultures three. It's just a few tweaks away yep. from Death Cultures three, which. That was, yeah. Roz wasn't around for Death Cultures 3, so I just tried to throw things together so it could keep on going. Oh, okay. Maybe I'll do Death Cultures 4 now. Oh, oh boy. That would be cool. That yeah, would yeah, actually I, be I really cool. I finding these things he and I did, but are never, never have been released. Yeah, and it's, it's great to I, know that stuff like that still exists. Yeah, so that's a good idea. Yeah. Death Cultures 4. <laughs> <laughs> well, but having... I have a digital copy of Death Cultures 2. I have an original of Death uh-huh. Cultures 3. There's really only two tracks on 2 that are not on 3, and one of them's just a yeah. remake. One of them's a remake. Frightened Again. Yeah, it was just filler. Kind yeah. Of stuff. I wasn't that crazy. I mean, I like Ice Pick and Good American, and and Roz did. Um, Roz and I went on a camping trip once. First camping trip he ever went on. And we sampled some stuff, and you know, did some stuff like on the road and that's what the basis of Ice Pick is. And then his reading of the the lobotomy thing. Yeah, Dr. Fr- Walter Freeman, the lobotomist. He lobotomized yeah. he lobotomized uh, John F. Kennedy's sister, Rosemary. And she, oh yeah, God. and she Freeze. spent the, she spent the rest of her life living in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin as disabled and had to be taken care of by people because oh, her bet. brain was so messed up. Oh, I bet. I mean, what a stupid thing they did. Like, yeah, it's barbaric. <laughs> totally barbaric. You know, I call it uh, a pharmaceutical lobotomy is still here, you know. These people take all kinds of things to put that part of their brain to sleep and, you know, at least they don't have to use an ice pick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it's worse. It's very because worse. It's so subtle. I mean, people just don't know that they're getting a lobotomy until they get it, and then so many take those drugs and scream, "God, I hate these drugs!" You know, because they don't really want to be asleep. So, you know, but they'll take other drugs and wow, go wow, <laughs> I'm awake. But that drug, the one I was on, methamphetamine, yeah, is really bad. Yeah, it's like speed. It's like worse than cocaine, I hear. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cocaine is nothing compared to this. <laughs> it just turns your sexual libido into, woo! <laughs> <laughs> wow, man. But there's a price to pay. Yeah. Indeed. So, I don't know if this is a difficult question for you to answer or not, but... I don't how, know. You have to ask me. How did you find out Roz died? Oh, I was at Jean's. I think I was, was I, yeah, I wasn't, wait, 98, no, I wasn't, yeah, that's right, I was in uh, Marin County, and, um, yeah, I was, just happened to be at Jeans, and somebody called, and, you know, Gene kind of looked choked up, and hung up the phone, and he said, yeah, Roz died, he hung up, so, and I kind of, you know, for a minute, I thought, oh, well, that was expected. <laughs> of course he died. <laughs> it wouldn't, yeah. He had talked and about it many I times. a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And poor baby, he needed to go home. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, yeah. And and I was pretty distant from it at, the point, at that point. Yeah. And, yeah, you were left out so, of Wound of Exit, which... Uh, surprised me when I read the credits that Paris it surprised had built. Bu- when it came out. Yeah. <laughs> I think Carl called me and said, were you on that at all? And I said, what? And he said, the last thing that premature ejaculation did. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And I kind of took offense to it. I thought, wow, you didn't tell me or anything? That was kind of mean. I got to be so honest. That's what Ballard did to him. I, if I'm being honest, my first impression of Wound of Exit was, what the fuck is this? Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a little bit like Helter. Yeah. Oh, you know? e- no. And I, I mean, the I, first I Helter like album, maybe. <laughs> the first Helter album, okay. maybe. Uh, Elden, yeah. the, uh, maybe. But it 
at least there is there's there's something going on in the background behind all that static wound of exit to me is like nothing but noise loops over and over yeah. and over with a high tech synth in in a studio uh-huh. where it's not well, done at Paris, home as far as i know he and paris did all of it you know yeah that's all i know because he died shortly thereafter you know mm-hmm. so yeah he died before it could even be deemed actually completed but oh okay so that kind of makes sense so i think so last word on that maybe yeah sort of amped it up a bit but they just said well this is how crazy it was so oh. you know, let's put it out there he did say he was working on a double album before he died for pe and wound of exit is a double album it's just not what i was expecting and supposedly oh, okay. supposedly there's like preliminary rough demos of wound of exit from an earlier time but the people behind the pe oh. releases from a decade ago had never put it out but they have copies of it you know Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just don't have much information about that at all. Yeah. I mean, you know, just a big surprise to me. Wow. And yeah. A little bit of a slap in the face. Right. And I was Cause told... Because I, I put so much hard effort and work into the, the stuff that came before that, and for him to just, like, you know, make that and then disappear was kind of like, you know... And it's, and it's crazy, because, like, <laughs> you guys had done Maritime Hall... And uh, the yeah. and the showcase theory in Corona, shortly before that. Yeah, you're yeah. The last time you played with Roz was at the showcase theater in Corona. You remember yeah, anything okay, about that, that was night? The last time. Oh, I'm glad you told me that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I didn't really remember those the sequence of events that occurred around that time, but because I was just very different. And I would just come in for a little bit and do whatever I did and then disappear, you know. And so I, I wasn't privy to a lot of the information. I, I, like I said, I just stayed in the background being effective. And, um, you know. Just... Premature ejaculation out of all the projects in his career was Roz's favorite. Wow, that's really nice to hear. Mm-hmm. And I, Nico tells me that too, man. And I think about that a lot. I think, well, yeah, because, you know, we, we really, he had a great, great partner in the time, you know, and it was me. And I can say that clearly today, and I don't feel like I'm, you know, tooting my own horn or anything. But, you know, out of all the people that he had to interact with, most of them were rock star types. And, yeah. You know, they just, you know, a lot of them did premature ejaculate. Yeah. <laughs> the great ones you know so i like how you use that term is, is for to mean like self-destruction it's it's not a yeah, medical term for men yeah. that have problems you know <laughs> yeah but like many yeah, there pe- been so many great ones that he loved too you know like and I, I, when i saw the doors movie and i thought oh my god that's Roz. <laughs> you know i mean if he had been able to get the right backup and stuck with the program that he entered in this whole thing with, you know, he could have been just as big as one of these guys. There are some very strong similarities between Jim Morrison and Roz Williams. Oh, I think so. Yeah. They were walking sort of parallel paths of, of sorts. Mm-hmm. And so he, and he, he was with Alice Cooper and, you know, and definitely David Bowie. Yeah. <laughs> Up until up until Let's Dance. Yeah, right. Well, we all kind of fell out of his understanding. I don't know. I liked his last album. Some of his stuff on his uh, David Bowie's last album are. It's very dark. Yeah, very, Black Star. You know, it's you know. really sad yeah. too. Really sad. Yeah, I, I I love some of the songs on there, and some of the videos he did with like Trent Reznor and stuff were really smart. How do you think he would have felt about Black Star if he'd have lived? Oh, I think he would have. He loves it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was. He wasn't like as diehard of a fan out of him towards the end of his life as he was when he was younger, from what I hear. If you listen Uh-oh. to the 1996 Golgotha interview, he pretty I'm much turning re- into a weird robot. <laughs> <laughs> he, the sound, what your voice is coming in as like a robot sort of thing. Yeah, and it's saying I'm getting a lot of 
static. Yeah. Yeah, we are. It's a connection issue on my end. Okay. And we well, should be uh, all right. Yeah. Anything else from the questions that you have that I can answer pretty easily or clear up any confusion? Or? No, I mean, it's, I, I think we're, do, we're doing pretty well here. Um, like I said, I'm just overwhelmed yeah. at what I could be asking you. Um, okay, live at, when you guys performed at The Graduate at an unknown date in 1987, we still don't know when, you want to go into that? That was done through Plessid, if I'm right. Oh, okay, so that was me being ever everlasting happy life. Yep. Yeah, and so I, I just did that all on my own. I went up there. It was kind of like the first time I went on stage on my own and um it had a funny little story because somebody showed up at the unexpectedly some drunk person comes into the venue i just started playing and he starts screaming at what i was showing on the screen which was a bunch of knots you know people being shoveled into graves and stuff which was the video in the the last video in not not the real criminal war basically it was that video and this guy shows up and he's like horrified at what's being shown at this very you know plain jane kind of venue but um david said don't worry about it don't worry about it just keep going keep going we'll get rid of him and he was screaming at me and so it was kind of funny but it was it feels like a very that was a very quick performance and but it did get me out thinking that you know i can do something on my own too you know i don't mm. have to depend on roz well you and roz both did a performance there too that what you and roz both did a performance as pe at the graduate as well yeah yeah I and mean, that was more i didn't do that but um i don't know whatever conflict i had i couldn't be there and he did it with um eric freeman and because they were going to UC Berk, um, UC um, Santa Barbara. Okay. And so, and he was, he, I, he actually stayed up there for a while, and that's probably when he did that. And maybe that's what got me into the idea that I could do that too hmm. um, with David. And I don't know where they were, but I did that alone. David so, seems to have disappeared. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't heard from him in ages. Yeah. I have heard from Oma Wynn from time to time. And apparently, Omowin has an a-, a new album. Yeah. Or has, you know... Two of them. So that's another person I need to contact, because I definitely want to do some things with her. She's just great. Yeah. yeah she's a, a, she's a, a great really, person. We had a great connection. I helped produce one of her first things, and, you know, so we know each other from way back when, just like Eva, you know, and we have very interesting, you know, interactions her music's very is probably the most an obscure and rare of the entire catalog of happiest is that right? yeah huh. yeah well that shouldn't be <laughs> mm. and you know she did something so cool when i lost last saw her you know I, i've been in contact with her over messenger but when i last saw her um she did a show about nico you know the under, velvet underground nico yeah she and died in 88 Yeah. It was all her Nico songs, and it was brilliant. It was totally brilliant. I was I was so amazed at her talent. Yeah. And uh, she just put it off so well, and it was in this little art space in San Francisco, and um, I just had such great respect for her. And yeah. Her, her ability to, you know, just throw it out there. She was also heavily involved in the performing arts scene out there at the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, here's uh, something else people should know is that my bigger vision is that Ron Athey come in on this too. Get on it, Ron. I'm in contact with him, and he's going to come see the show in Las Vegas, I think, or Palmdale. I'm not sure which one. So another reason to get really, you know, fun and playful and bring Ron in on this because that would be really cool. You know, first it was Ron and Roz, not then it was Chuck and Roz, and now it's Ron and Chuck. Yeah. And he told me right away, well, I'm not a musician. But I said, what? I am. You, you can be the clown up front, you know. Yeah, that's what, yeah, just take Roz's role, man. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And he does an amazing job. That guy is like next level. 
you know, he's I, so smart about how he does interviews and stuff. And I saw him, you know, on YouTube. There's all these interviews of him, and he's just like so clear about what he his, his art and stuff. It just when I saw that, I said, "Oh God, I gotta get him on my, you know, up here with me." <laughs> there's a quick scene in the X Files on an episode called UPO, and the camera pans to a TV, and Ron's on it giving an interview. So Ron Athey has yeah he has an uncredited cameo in the X Files, but he, oh that's great yeah I like to know that he yeah. it's just an interview of him on a TV playing in the background of a scene but it's it's noticeably there it's great it's uncredited cameo role I mean appearance love you know seeing stuff like that just kind of like you know no let you know you're connected because you're you're attracting all these kinds of things. Yeah. You know, you're a big fan of all this. And so you're going to bring in all these kinds of things. And, you know, other people could give a shit. But why did you just all of a sudden look at the TV at that point and say, oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, the discography of premature ejaculation, both released and unreleased, is so vast. It's hard. Like, especially with the unreleased stuff, it's hard to tell what you played on or not. Like six, for example. Were you involved with Six at all? What does what's on Six? Because I, is that a malaise release? Yeah, it's a premature ejaculation one. Rosnet first put it out in 1999. It's like 16 or 18 untitled tracks, or 12 or 13, something along there. But you know, I might. I think I have that CD somewhere around, and I haven't listened to it in 10 years. Yeah. So I really don't know what's on it. I mean, there were so many things that Malay's music threw out, and I just said, oh, my God, you know, this is not very organized. This is not... But they didn't have any way to organize it, and I had disappeared. I th thought I was not going to be a part of all this. And um, so if I go back in there and listen to it, I could certainly, you know, say, oh, this is from there, this is from there, you know, whatever. But mm -hmm. it'll all come clear pretty soon. Yeah, because some of that stuff, like, nobody exactly knows when it was recorded. We just know it was, like, anywhere between, like, 85 and 89, you know. Like, yeah, uh, then if that's the time period, pretty much, it sounds like PE. It's probably something I put together. Sure. So, uh, but, um, and, and I don't know, maybe there's something that I didn't hear that was, like, what Roz and... Uh, Eric and etc. Yeah, I'd have to hear it. Maybe it'll show up. See, like I, the freaks thing showed up. You know, I want to hear it now. So you know. Just, See, I always you know, knew that Eric Freeman was was close to Roz and that he was part of Cointel Pro and he did shows with you guys. But I never knew like he was actively involved in premature ejaculation recordings. I, know, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, he didn't. He never came over and like sat down like Roz did, you know, and, and we played together. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, you know, the recordings of the live recordings made basis for a lot of the studio, you know, what seemed to be a studio recording. Yeah. So it's hard to say who was on which, where, when, you know, because it was just like, grabbing these live tapes and then seeing what I wanted to use out of them and then sampling them and then creating pieces. Yeah. Nuts. What was I going to ask? But when that? he did, you know, when he went to, um, I don't know, when, once he was back in San Francisco. I don't know how, oh no, he was in LA. When, yeah, so he was in West Hollywood. And that, that whole period of time, he was living with Ryan and uh, Eric. Eric away, and that I didn't know much about what was going. On. Yeah, that's when they were in the Fairfax area of Hollywood. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ryan was really young back then. <laughs> I've seen pictures. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I'll, like, he was involved with some of this stuff too, primarily through EXP, because that was him and Paris's band. Ross kind of came oh. in later. I didn't realize that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was... Par a lot of people don't. A EXP was originally Paris and Ryan. The Roz played oh. bass later, and then everybody else like Iggy and Doriandra, you know, began to get involved. But the core of EXP was always Ryan and Paris. 
so it's you know when, once that project picked up off the ground then the whole family if you will of musicians started to yeah. coming or started coming around like and then, Israel Medina, yeah. David E. Williams, Kenton Holmes, you know, all sorts of other people that were involved. And then he, you know, he reunited oh, with Jatan. I really, uh, what was, he was brilliant, you know. You're breaking up. The contributors to, um, I've never had him. Or, you're, I, Chuck, you're breaking up. Was, oh, I know, it's getting bad. And, you know, I just want to tell you, I've got to get off about 10 minutes or so. Okay, I mean, yeah. I mean, if we gotta end that, then that's that's understandable. But you know, when you're done with the Nico thing, and you're always welcome to come we'll back. One. You're yeah. always welcome to do a follow up. I loved having you. Uh, everybody here that's listening loved having you here, and it's a pleasure. You're the first interview the Scholar Society's ever being done. Here early. <laughs> yeah, I know you're a morning bird, man. So I had to get a hold of you in the morning for sure. Yeah, and that's when I'm best. Mm -hmm. I'm really the best. Absolutely. Most people are. All righty. Okay. Well, not most people. It's <laughs> understandable. So, all right, man. Well, I'll cut it then. And do your thing. Thanks for coming on, and I, I, I look yeah, forward to hearing from you. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Thank you all so much for your support. I hope you have enjoyed this interview, and I hope you have enjoyed being witness to the Ros Williams Scholar Society's first interview. It has always been a pleasure of mine to have known Chuck, and I'd like Chuck. I'd like to thank you personally for helping me out and being a support for me when I was in drug treatment. Thank you so much, and thank you all for your continued support. Uh, we'll be, we will see each other again.